right? Whenever it comes to really any sort of investment that you're making, regardless if it's in an IRA or outside of an IRA, you know, before pulling the trigger on anything, you have to do, you you have to take care of your own education, right? Do research into how they're going to be structured. What's the risk? What's the risk tolerance that you have personally? Uh, what are the risks exposed with each type of investment? All of that overall is encompassing of what is your due diligence, right? And I think of all the investments that we have here, multifamily due diligence is some of the most important, right? Because it's going to uh, it's going to include some factors that actually aren't included in any other type of investment. So with that being said, what I want to do is go ahead and introduce Joseph Bermonte from Triarch Real Estate Partners to go over the 20 factors to consider before investing into multifamily investments. So Joseph, I give the floor to you. Great. All right, guys. And is the mic on? I think so. Yes. Cool. All right. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction. So, yeah, I'm Joseph Ramonte, CEO of Track Real Estate Partners. We have a lot to cover today. Actually, so much that we're only going to be able to cover seven because I could have just covered all 20 and left you just a list that you didn't really know how to use, or I could spend a few minutes actually talk through each bullet point. So, I decided to go ahead and talk through each bullet point of what we're going to go over. Uh, there will be a QR code at the end to get the whole list downloaded. And we'll do probably a follow-up presentation, probably a part two and a part three to cover the rest of it. But there's 48 slides. So I was a little uh, frustrated myself that I was like, wow, this is actually not going to compress this into an hour. Uh, so a little bit about me. I've been doing this. I've uh, been a general partner in multifamily for the last 12 years. Engineer by trade. Used to work for Exxon and then made the transition back in 2012. Uh, I've owned 14 apartment complexes, done about $285 million. Uh, 265 million in assets. Uh, we have a dedicated multi, and we're dedicated strictly to multifamily real estate. We don't do anything else but multifamily. Uh, and uh, so we've done three renovations that have been over 30,000 per door, had five exits that are about 23.5% IRR, 2.6 equity multiples. So we've done some really big deals. We're doing two uh, developments right now, about 507 units total. Uh, and then on the side, I've created back in 2020 the Passive Investing Academy, uh, which is an online university, which is just for passive investors to teach you really we, much more than what we're going to cover today. Uh, but it's, it's all from the perspective of the passive investor. Uh, and the goal of that course is to really protect passive investors because uh, in, in response to just the decline in the quality of deals that you start to see coming through, you see a lot of uh, new sponsors, which, you know, it's great. We all start somewhere, but they're all being presented as if we're all, you know, as if they're experienced sponsors. And that's not exactly correct. Uh, and then later this year, really excited for my book that's coming out, The Passive Investor's Playbook, A Guide to Winning at Multifamily. It's going to be a great book that kind of covers a lot of what's in that, um, in that course. Uh, so two slides more on Triarch. So our company, we're founded in 2013. We're a full-service, vertically integrated company, uh, full management team and construction team, which is a bit unique. Uh, our focus is on the acquisitions, management, renovation of multi-unit properties. Um, our principals, significant experience. So while we're a relatively young company, our principals have an average of about 23 years experience. We've owned or operated over 47,000 units, about 1.9 billion in assets over our average careers, again, 23 years. Um, as a company, we've done about 375 million in transactions. We currently have a portfolio of about 1,650 units uh, and about 240 million assets. I already mentioned our returns and our investment strategy is really looking to unlock uh, underperforming assets and, and undervalued properties. Uh, and we definitely do that by utilizing our in-house capabilities. And here's our team. This is the last slide. So there's me. I got Jared, who runs our acquisitions team. So we got dedicated people that are running these individual areas. Uh, Jared, uh, who runs acquisitions. Carrie runs asset management. Deborah runs operations. And Robert runs construction. So cool thing about Robert is he actually used to work in operations then made to switch over. So he's got 10 years of product management experience. Uh, and then Carrie and Deborah uh, each have over 35 years of experience individually. So it's a significant amount of experience of the company, about 115 years combined. Uh, so some testimonies about what we're going to talk about. So, you know, this, these guys have all taken the course and, you know, what I like about Steve here, he's a full-time passive investor. He's been doing passive investing for like 20 years and he got a ton of value out of the course. 
Same with Imran and same with Uri. So it's great to see those testimonials. So now let's get into the meat of it. So why are we here? Well, we're here because of this one particular paragraph uh, that's in every uh, investment uh, you're going to see. And there's this big disclaimer, and I kind of capitalized and underlined the section that you need to be noticed about, which is that the managing member or the general partner or the sponsor uh, is in, or the syndicator is in no way guaranteeing the projections contained herein. And the last one, please consult your attorney, CPA, and or professional financial advisor regard, regarding the suitability of an investment for you. The problem with that last sentence, though, is I'm not sure if any of you have actually taken one of these deals to your CPA or attorney or professional advisor, but a lot of them don't have a ton of experience in multifamily. A lot of those people, they, you know, your CPA or your financial advisor, they know stocks, right? And CPAs, they know, you know, accounting but they don't really know the ins and outs of a professional multifamily. And so you're, you're advised to go to these resources, but then you go to them and they tell you, well, I don't know. And then they try and send you somewhere else. So you're, you're, it's kind of a tough situation here. So again, trust, but verify. So we're, today we're going to teach you how to verify a, a large portion of what you're going to see in some deals. So here's your first check and we're going to cover seven of them. So you want to verify that the sponsor has at least five years of multifamily experience or uh, or a less favorable option. So you know, if you can't get five years experience, that their background or skill set includes the relevant experiences such as project management or business or something along those lines that would play well into multifamily. Uh, maybe if they're an art major and they're trying to go and do multifamily syndication, nothing against art, art majors. My mom's an art major but probably not the best for trying to run and take down an apartment complex and be good stewards of your money. So I, I like to give this example here of, of marketing. You know, we've, we've all seen these ads on the left. You've got your McDonald's hamburger on the right. You've got your, you know, kind of mom and pop hamburger stand. And so you're sold, both are sold and advertised the same, but the problem is once you actually get home, once you've made your purchase and you pull the hamburger out of the bag, you, you know, on the right, you've still got the same, but on the left side, you've, you realize that you've, you've been duped a little bit. So we're trying to make sure that doesn't happen here. Um, and then the other question is around experience. You know, we, many of you have all had kids, you've got teenagers, um, teenagers know how to drive cars, but would you let them drive the family on the family road trip, maybe you know, five hours away somewhere at speed with the whole family in the car? Could they do it? Maybe. Is it the best or the safest thing to do? Maybe not. And the consequence is pretty dire because the whole family's in that car. Well, you should view your investment the same way. You know, your investment is your family's money and you really want to make sure that the person behind the wheel has just a ton of experience and it can get you from point A to point B. So five years experience is the recommendation. Why five years? Well, everybody's heard the term 10,000 hours to master anything. Full-time work for a year is 2,000 hours times five years is 10,000 hours. So that just kind of works out that way. Also, typically a deal, you've noticed the deal terms are about five years. You're going to buy it and you're going to sell it in five years. So if they have five years experience, then that means they've probably sold a deal that they can then point to as a track record. If they've not been doing it for five years, then they don't really have a track record they can point to. And then also 45% of businesses go under in less than five years. So you want to know that they're going to be around for a while. And there's like a 50, 50 chance that they're not going to be around uh, after five years. So if they've been, or if they've got that five years experience, you know that, Hey, there's a better chance you'll be around. So here's some important questions to ask uh, because I know it sounds simple to you and I asking how many years of experience you have, but uh, you really want to get around any games that can be played with the start date of that five years. So the very specific question you want to ask is, when did you buy your first apartment complex? Not when did you start hunting for it? Or when did you first learn about multifamily? Or when did you first get interested in multifamily? When did you first close on your first apartment complex and become an apartment owner? That's when you want to start the clock. Next is what is their role in the project? Uh, especially in today's market, uh, syndication has evolved greatly since I started, you know, 12 years ago. Um, it has now become just this, you know, conglomerate of multiple capital raisers and a 
bunch of individuals that are joint venturing on an individual deal, individual deal, but don't really have any other ties to each other than just that one particular deal. So you want to understand what is the role of the person that you're talking to in this deal? Uh, are they the capital raiser? Are they the asset manager? Are they, or is it their deal? Are they the ones who found the deal and they're sponsoring the deal? So you want to kind of get down and ask those questions. Check two, confirm that the sponsor is located in the market of the property or has significant experience in that specific market. So this is a map of Houston. It's a little bit hard to see, but let's play some quick games here. And um, so a lot of you are probably from Houston, I'm assuming. We all may know the good parts and the bad parts of town. So like, what would be an example of a bad part of town that you probably wouldn't want to invest in? Well, I guess it's, if someone said Greens Point initially, I wouldn't necessarily want to do that unless I want higher maintenance, but there could be higher yields. Yeah. So Greens Point, great example. What's an example of a good part of town? Montrose. Great. River Oaks, Montrose. We all generally know because we live in Houston. How about Dallas? Anybody know the good parts and the bad parts of Dallas? No? No? Okay, so that's two. How about Charlotte? But where's the bad parts? And, see, and then the last question, what about Phoenix, Arizona? Does anybody know that one? Well, our headquarters were okay, you don't, so somebody, <laughs> but the point is that most people wouldn't know. And just like you don't know, the sponsor also doesn't know. And so for somebody, you saw how hard it was. That was just four markets. So to have expertise in each of those markets is not the easiest thing to do. It's much more realistic to have expertise in one particular market, let alone to go beyond two, three, and four markets. So when you're investing with a sponsor, you want to know, like, hey, is this your backyard? Is this where you're doing most of your investing? Or even if you're based in Phoenix, but you're buying here in Houston, is are most of your properties and most of your acquisitions, is this your focus? Um, so it's okay to be outside the market, uh, but as long as this is the only market, the mar only market they're focusing on. But obviously, if they're from the particular market, they would be, have a better chance to do well. Also, because you know Houston's a very dynamic. We know that. There's a lot of parts of towns that we drive by. We see the, we can see the construction. We can see the area neighborhood turning that that takes years to show up in the data. So you've got a leg up on somebody who's looking at just that data. And I can look from outside my car window as I'm driving by to see that, Hey, this area is turning. I should probably do something. Check number three, uh, verify that the sponsor has a track record of success of successful exits and or actual versus pro forma, uh, pro forma performance on previous projects that fall within a 20% difference. So that was a little bit funny. Uh, you can't have a bad track record if you've never gotten a game, if you don't do anything. So basically everybody has, it's like when you go to college, you start off with a 4.0 GPA. Everybody's got a perfect track record when you go to university until you actually start taking tests. And then you realize, okay, maybe I'm not a 4.0 student, but initially we're all about Victorians. Um, so some requirements you want to look for is uh, that track record is earned, not given. So assume the worst until proven otherwise. Returns for exited deals only. So I've, I've seen examples where you'll have what's called a recap. So you'll have an in individual investor. Maybe you've been an investor who's exited a deal by yourself. Uh, now, what I've seen is you'll, you'll see sponsors take credit for the return that an individual investor made or may have made on a deal when they by themselves exited, but isn't necessarily reflective of if the whole deal were to be sold, because we don't know if this, you know, I've seen in this case where the guy was sold for an above market valuation of the deal. And if they would actually try to sell the deal, the rest of the investors would not have made that same return, but it was advertised as if the entire deal made that return because they had a few guys exiting for whatever reason. Uh, so be wary of that. Uh, you want to look for projections versus actuals for the most recent transactions. So uh, ideally what you want to see is that the, um, that they're within, you know, for the income side that they're within or the above side, they're 20 or 30% uh, above, or that they're not more than 20 or 30% below their projections. So if they're projecting that the, uh, the NOI of the deal would be, you know, a million dollars for the year, you want to know that, okay, well, if they actually did 1.3 million, 
that's probably on the outer band of what you'd want to see. It's good that they're above, but uh, or if they did eight hundred thousand, you know, again, that's that's probably right at the limit or or below what you'd want to see. And the reason is if it shows that they're basically they don't have a lot of confidence in their numbers. You really want them to have a tighter band for what they're estimating, for what they're actually achieving uh, on the NOI numbers. Because once they get outside of that, you know, you could use the guise of oh, we're being conservative, or you can just say you're just guessing. They're both the same in that situation. Uh, so you're really looking for realistic projections as an investor. Um, and then just watch for games with the IRR. The IRR is one of the easiest metrics to play games with. Uh, for shorter investment periods, you can produce a much higher IRR. So if I hold a deal for 14 months, which you really shouldn't hold a deal for 14 months, or even in the example given here, I'm holding it for one year. I made a 30% IRR on the deal because I held it for one year and I just produced a 30% return. 30% return is good, but you're here to invest for the long term. We're not trying to do short term hops because every time you move your money, great, you made a lot of money on that one deal. Now you've got to put it into another deal. And are you? what's the likelihood of you hitting another deal for 30% in the next year? So it's just, it creates uh, a lot of challenges for you. So you really want to be in deals for at least three years, uh, if not longer. Uh, you know, a lot of people just cap out around seven, but between that three to seven year horizon. But as you go shorter, just know that your IRR will go up. So now let's talk about the number one performance metric. Here's two examples, uh, property one and two. Uh, the uh, but one was purchased for an NOI of $100,000 and sold at an NOI of 125. Cap rate went from 6.25 to 5%, and the value went from 1.6 million to 2.5. Property two, uh, NOI from 100 to 150,000, cap rate 6.25 to 6, and the value went from 1.6 to 2.5. Which deal was better? Which property would you say performed or performed better? Well, the one that had the most NOI growth. You really want to focus on NOI growth because you can't control cap rates. Nobody here can control cap rates. If we could, well, I wouldn't be here because we'd be doing different kind of deals. But the cap rate is market driven, but the NOI is sponsor driven. So look for sponsors who've driven the NOI uh, and done much greater with the, get the property they were given than those that just kind of lucked up on a particular market performing. And there is, you know, there's value to be had for choosing a good market and timing a market and going into a market that's about to go on the run. That's there's certainly something for that. But when you're already in a good market, you should be looking at the NOIs. Check number four, confirm that the sponsor is vertically integrated with in-house management or that third party management is local, local slash regional and not nationwide, i.e. they're not some giant operator. So in-house versus third party, typically in-house is going to be for more experienced operators. You've got to have a certain uh, critical mass to afford to bring all those teams in-house, like, like we illustrated here earlier. Uh, third party, you know, we all typically start off with third party. My first deal, my first couple of deals were all third party. Eventually, though, you're going to bring it in-house. You want to match the size. And of course, there are exceptions. You know, you look at uh, another reason why you might be third party though is when you're going into uh, markets that are new markets. So if I'm in Houston, I'm trying to go into a new market that I don't have my team in. Sure, I might leverage a third party manager company at that point to get into that market. But then eventually, once I get some critical mass there, I would then bring it all in house again. So you want to try to match the size of the operator with the third party company in that instance. So if they're a kind of a boutique. Um, if it's a smaller operator, you want them to be with a boutique kind of third-party operator. If they're a large operator, then they should be with a giant, you know, larger uh, third-party group. So, for example, like uh, Graystar. Graystar is a giant manager company. They think they're one of the largest. Um, I, even us, we're kind of medium-sized, small to medium-sized. I would never do a do a Graystar. Not that they're uh, a bad company, but for us, they probably wouldn't do the best job because I don't add enough value to them because they're so huge. I'm not going to get their best and their brightest on our deals. They're going to be catering to the Blackstones or their portfolio. And, and I'm the kind of client that, you know, I'm probably not going to be a repeat client with them or I'm going to try and bring it in house eventually. So you just got to understand uh, those dynamics. 
Check number five, you want to ensure that the comparable properties used are within one to two mile radius and closely resemble the subject property in terms of size, age, and renovation level. Excuse me. So we actually have, we're gonna spend a little bit of time on these next couple of slides because we've got some examples we're gonna go through because these are, now we're getting into some more deal specific stuff. So we'll get a little bit, a little more detailed. So comparables, those are your set of properties that match the subject property, the property you're buying uh, in regards to the vintage, so the age, the condition of the property, the location of the property, and the size. And you're gonna use these comparable properties to set the market rents or your post renovation rents uh, and the value add scope for the property that you're buying. And this right here makes or breaks a deal. If you get this wrong, there is no deal. Uh, and you'll see a lot of people will try to force a deal by forcing comps that maybe aren't the best. Uh, and so we're gonna go over an example like that. So here's what you're looking for as a passive in regards to comps and as an active. Uh, you wanna know that they're within a one to two mile radius. The closer they are, the better they are. If a map is not provided, then go to the internet, go to Google and search the properties yourself. I've done this numerous times and that's just what, and that's how we do it. Um, so just because a map isn't shown, then you need to go and use your resources and find that map. Verify that the comps are sponsor selected and not broker selected. Nothing against any brokers, uh, but there is such a thing as broker math and brokers are known for cherry picking deals uh, and inexperienced sponsors are known for just copying the broker packages and using the deals that the broker told them because the broker told me this was the comp. It's like, well, that's what the investor is depending on your experience for. Is you're supposed to know better if this is a real comp or not. Uh, and so the broker, they're trying to show the best comps out there because they're trying to sell the deal for the most money. And they can do that by convincing you this or us, the sponsor, that there's a big upside here. So of course they're gonna show us something. And then the sponsor is, you know, unfortunately is incentivized to show uh, high comps because they can then show high returns and they can attract money very easily. So as a passive, you know, you've got two parties that are not really in your favor picking comps. So you've got to double check those comps very closely to make sure that these really are comps. So is it close to my property? Is it? Does it look the same? Was it built the same, roughly the same year? And does it have a renovation story that's similar? And then also you wanna look for natural or man-made demarcation lines. So we've all heard that expression, you know, the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, I was actually doing a case study on a deal just a month ago. And the properties were within a one mile radius. Uh, they were similar vintage. So they were checking the boxes. Um, and, but when you actually map them, cause there wasn't a map shown, and that's always my first red flag. When there's no map, I'm like, uh, why is there no map? So that's the first, if there's no map, then you should, that's your first red flag. Um, so I went and I looked and I was like, okay, well they do look close, but then when you look closer, there was this highway. I think it was like highway 144, it was up north somewhere. And all the other properties were, grouped together on the north side of the highway around this one particular street. And then this one was like three quarters of a mile south on the other side of that highway. And when you start looking around that market on the other side of that highway, you realize, ah, oh, this isn't really the same. When you do the street view and you look around, you realize, ah, oh, this isn't really, these are two different markets. Um, and so, you know, and it's easy to do. It took me three, four minutes to get up and look and, and realize, ah, oh, this highway here serves some purpose. It's kind of like here in Houston, you got 59 on downtown. It, it can really make a big dividing line between the two areas. Or yeah, four, street by street. Yeah. Literally. Or even, even 45 going north, north of I-10, you got the heights on the left and on the right side, you've got, uh, I forget what it's called, Cavalcade and Fulton, that whole area. I own a property there and it's just like, We've been there for 10 years and it's taken forever for that North area to turn. Village. North side village. It's taken forever for it to turn. It's turning now. But if I showed you a map of my property and a mile away, there's this Heights property and tried to use them as comps, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be correct. Oops. So here's an example we're going to look at. Uh, so this was a deal. I forget. This was up north somewhere. 
this is an actual deal uh, that was presented or shown to me by investors through the Passive Investing Academy. So we break down stuff like that there. Uh, so this deal, you know, they're showing average in-place rents of $1,300. You've got average pro forma rent of $1,649. So they're increasing at $311. Like, wow, this is this sounds like a great deal. Uh, but my my ears perked up though when I saw that the vintage was it was brand new. It was a lease up. So you know we do development, and development is extremely tough. You're you're not doing development if you don't know what you're doing, uh, and so. These are very sophisticated guys out there doing development deals. And the idea that they're going to leave $300 per unit on the table is just ridiculous. Um, and so that was the first kind of like red flag for me. Like this doesn't even pass the smell test for me. Like why would this developer, this is millions and millions, $300 times, I forgot it's how many units it was. It's 250, 248 units at 300 bucks at a 5% cap rate. I mean, that was millions of dollars. Um, so that was my first red flag, but then I started looking, um, and so I saw, okay, well, the vintages are the similar there. So similar vintage, um, similar sized units. That's the other thing I mentioned. I think I mentioned sizing. So this was a big one, right? <laughs> but you got some smaller ones and for whatever reason, you know, they're just, you know, you can have the boutique apartments, um, and then you can have these large ones. And so there is, you know, ideally you want them to be roughly the same size. Uh, you also want to look at the unit size. That's an interesting one. So these are all roughly the same size as far as square footage of units. One of the games that you can see, uh, um, games is probably the wrong word, but it's one of the things you can see is when you're, you're incorrectly comparing a property that has small units versus a property that has large units, and you're thinking, oh, well, look, the rent per square foot is there's 20 cents more. It's like, yeah, but their units are 300 square feet smaller. So it's just a math illusion there that, but when you look at the whole dollar amount, the whole on a whole dollar basis, they're only fifty dollars apart. So anyway, this was the rent guide that was or the rent schedule I was given, and they did give us a map. And then that was like the second red flag. I was like, well, there's your issue right there. So uh, let's go back. So we've got this element deal, and these are listed in the order of greatest difference. So the difference is there a pointer here? Is this same point? Oh, well, and the, the y'all ever have amenities on the side too? Or <laughs> no, not on, not on here. We wouldn't show the amenities. That would, that would be on the other income section or if you're as far as like the income provided or well, if you're looking at a detail because some of them don't have any amenities. Yeah. This one has the clubhouse, the pool, the internet has everything. Yeah. So once you, that's like a second level of, of review. But first, we're just looking geographically, right? So I can see that one's got almost $500 delta, then 350, then 184, then you get down to these three and there's almost no difference. So they also didn't show you the numbering guide on here, which was frustrating because you had to actually, I had to actually map these problems, even though they gave me a map. I had to go with Google still to figure out what was six, which was two, which was three, um, or which was one, and which ones do you think were one, two, and six? It was the ones at the very top. So these were the ones, two, and six, the ones that are the farthest away. And then three, four, and five were these three right here. And what is the rent growth there? There's like almost nothing in rent growth. So that was uh, the first red flag. That deal, uh, so they did the underwriting based on a $311 increase. So the whole pro forma, all the returns, everything was based on that big rent increase which didn't exist. So all the investors who bought into that bought into a fairy tale that is never going to come true. And now, and this was two years ago or a year ago, uh, we're not thinking it was two years ago. So now you can just imagine how they're doing rents. Rates went up. They didn't get any rent growth. I mean, so this fundamental mistake here is basically a, a deal killer. Um, so be super careful on the rent comps. Uh, check number six is we're going to get into uh, renovation. So everybody these days is almost every deal is a value add deal, right? And so you there all there's always some renovation story that's going with the property that you're buying that they're going to create value somehow. So if you're renovating more than 50% of the units, you want to ensure that the vacancy rate uh, decreases uh, by five to ten percent during. Sorry, the vacancy rate increases. That's a typo. There it should be increases by five to ten percent during the 12 to 24 month renovation period 
with a greater increase for shorter renovation periods and a lesser increase for longer renovation periods. Um, so why is that? Well, first, let's understand what re rehab vacancy is. So the rehab vacancy, which is a term that we coined, uh, consists of um, the following activities. So first, the general contractor has to go in and, and demo the unit. Then they got to renovate it. Then the operating and contracting teams will go and they'll punch the unit to figure out, okay, is everything complete? Then they'll clean the unit. Then they'll lease the unit. Then there'll be a move in. Now, some of these can happen uh, at the same time, you know, like the leasing and the move in, you know, they can be leasing throughout the whole period. So you could just go from clean to move in really just depends. Sometimes you're not going to lease though, uh, until you know, you have a unit ready because you don't want to market a unit and then, then it, things get delayed and it's not ready. And then you just lost that tenant and you've wasted dollars on marketing. So your typical downtime for a unit is going to be about four to 12 weeks. So four for a very light rehab and 12 weeks for just a monster 30,000 per door renovation. Like that's gonna be on the extreme end. You'll probably not see those. Um, your typical downtime is gonna be about six, six to seven weeks for, for what you're doing. And again, that includes from when the unit's handed over to the contractor to demo it, to when a new resident moves back in. Uh, and that's for an average, you know, that, this number is two years old. So inflation is probably a bit higher now. That's probably closer to $10,000. Uh, but we're not talking a huge renovation. So scheduling, every project should have a schedule that matches the magnitude of the scope. So why, why does, why do you as a passive need to know about the scheduling? Well, you know, small projects, you're going to have a higher level sc schedule for large projects. You want to know that there's a detailed schedule. So if they're just going in and they're changing out floors and maybe they're going to spend a couple thousand dollars you don't really need a giant detailed schedule for that. You, you kind of trust that, that can get handled by itself. But if they're going in and they're spending $25,000, $30,000 per unit, they're changing out all the appliances, all the floors, all the counters, all the cabinets, uh, moving walls around, adding new tubs, and that's a lot of moving parts. Um, so you want to know that they, there's a schedule in place for that. They've thought about it uh, and they know how long it's going to take them to do all those different components. The schedule then ties into the construction draw schedule and the draw schedule. That's where the sponsor is going to the lender and saying, Hey, I need some more money to pay for this scope. I just did and to pay for these invoices. Well, every time they do that, the lender gives them the money, but then they increase the debt service. So when they increase the debt service, that decreases the cash flow. And so you want to know that that that's why it's important to have that schedule because it all ties together. And you want to know they've really thought about it from start to finish and how it impacts their, their cash flow. Because if, if they haven't, then maybe you might find out that, oh crap, we need what's called more construction reserve or interest reserve to cover, actually it's interest reserve, to cover our, um, our debt service. Because now our cash flow got too low and we, you know, we didn't anticipate that. And so we were gonna raise what's called an interest reserve which covers our debt service for the few months that our net cash flow goes negative while we're getting units out and then leasing them back up for the rest of the portfolio. So you just want to know that that's been thought out so they have that schedule. Exteriors are going to take roughly six to nine months. Interiors are going to take 12 to 24 months. Okay. So here's why all that's important. So we take all the information we just covered. Uh, you're going to break that into two components. So you got your base vacancy, which is the normal vacancy you always have when you buy the property. That's your base vacancy. So whatever it's operating at, that's what it's normally going to operate at. And then you add on top of that the rehab vacancy. And this is where we throw in a little bit of math. Uh, so you're going to set your rehab duration. So is it a 12, a 24-month, or a 36-month renovation they're doing? So the average, I said, is about 12 to 24 months. Uh, but you can do 36 months. Uh, so the reason you might do a longer renovation is because it means you're doing fewer units. So it's going to control your cash flow better. Now, the downside to that is if you do fewer units, you're going to have higher loss to lease. It means you're not going to get your rents fast enough. So you'll, you'll get your rent slower. So you're, it's a trade-off. Uh, and then you're going to have a set downtime. So how, uh, how long will each unit be down? Is it going to be down for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks? 
and you want to know that's calculated into or added into the system. And here's why. Here's a visual representation of what that looks like, at least from the from the downtime perspective. Because if you got a four week renovation, it's not a big deal. The unit goes down, it comes back up before you get to the next month. But when you get to a six week renovation, the second line, now you're you're overlapping. And even more, when you get to an eight week renovation, now you're starting a group and then you're starting the next group and you sort of finish the first group. And then the longest is when you start to get to 12 weeks and it just gets really crazy because by the time it gets to month three, you've got two groups stacked on top of another group. So you got three groups of vacancy there on top of each other. So this is like the one Excel page that we'll go over. But so here's an example of an eight week downtime. Uh, and so our downtime is eight weeks. Uh, our rehab duration is 12 months. So we're gonna go to the 12 month uh, rehab duration and our base vacancy is 5%. So you can see we start off at 20 and then because it's an eight week downtime, it, it stacks on top of each other. So it basically doubles. So now we got 41 units vacant here and 41. And this is a 250 unit property. So you get, you know, to do 250 units in 12 months, 250 divided by 12 uh, is 20. And then because I am doing it with over an eight week downtime each, then I'm getting 20 on top of each other. And then on the last month, which is not shown, which would be, I guess, month 13, it would be 20 again because you're finishing the month 12 units you started. You roll that down, your base vacancy was 5%, your rehab vacancy was 8.3. So you can see in the first month you start off at 13, and the second month you go up to 21.67 across. So you have 21% vacancy across the board, but I don't know about 13, you're back at 13 again, or possibly less. Hopefully. Possibly uh, 13. So on average for the year, you're at 21%. And on year two, you're at six and year three, you're at five. And I've, I've seen many, like almost tons of these uh, deals presented where we're doing a 12 month renovation, but there's no change in the occupancy. The vacancy stays exactly where it is. It's mathematically not possible. And that's what I'm showing you here is that this, this isn't a thing of like how great of a sponsor you are. It's like, no, the math says you can't physically do it. So, yes, question. Sure. Um, I'm a confirmation expert. You probably got the question. But, um, Hold on. I've got this cube that. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm, I'm neutral. This is probably a dumb question. But isn't there a danger of double dipping here? Because... If a unit I have, I'm always going to have one unit empty, right? Because it's vacant. Wouldn't that be the time to do a rehab on that one? And so theoretically, even if you've got a 5% base vacancy, the 5% of the 16.67 is, al is always going to be vacant. So you're really only increasing it potentially by 11.67 for the major so, months. Yeah. So what I think, yeah. So what you're assuming is that the available units, the units that are not being uh, renovated are going to maintain 100% occupancy in that example, which may or may not happen. In practice, what we've seen is it doesn't happen. You're always going to have some vacancy in your available units. All we're doing is we took off, we, we took some units offline. And the normal, I mean, the same reason why the property itself doesn't operate at 100% occupancy normally. It always operates as, because there's always some churn of units going in and out. And we're able to backfill it to some degree to keep that number high. But uh, you're always going to have some. Is there some slight double dipping? Yes. But for performance, for conservativeness, and if you're worried about that, then you can just lower your base number to 3%. So there's ways around it. So it's really how comfortable you feel with that. You know, how strong of a market am I in? Am I in a weak market where there's a lot of saturation, there's a lot of units, and so I'm going to have a hard time keeping my number up? Because also keep in mind, if you're going into a property that their stabilized occupancy is... 90%. They've got 10% on top that they've been unable to achieve for whatever reason. Uh, why would you assume that when they take units offline, that they would then all of a sudden be able to achieve 100% of all their available units? So it's that's why we underwrite this way. Uh, and so here's your vacancy cheat sheet. So you don't need to really think of any of that stuff now. You can just copy this. If the downtime for the units, it, it repeats. Uh, if it's a it's a 12 month duration deal, a 24 or a 36, and then you got your typical downtimes. And then to the left of that, I've calculated 
you know, what is the typical vacancies you would expect to see for those for that unit? Uh, and this assumes a base vacancy of 5%. And also, I just mentioned that the, I think I mentioned earlier, that your loss to lease will be higher uh, for slower renovations. And with that said, let's get into loss to lease. Um, wait. Oh, I, that was a typo. Well, I will give you guys that one. Basically, the loss to lease, I didn't copy it. I must accidentally delete it in my late edits. But so from memory, the loss to lease, the rule of thumb on loss to lease uh, is you're going to take, um, so loss to lease is the difference in your uh, contract rent for what you're actually getting. Actually, the rule of thumb is on the last slide here. So we'll go ahead. I'll get, you'll always get the full download later so you can see what the actual checkpoint seven said. But uh, loss to lease is what we're talking about, the gain from your gross potential rent to your actual in-place leases and the delta, because you know we can't change a contract that's locked in for 12 months, that delta is what's your loss to lease. So we've got some examples here. You got two scenarios. So you got scenario one where you got the loss to lease, which is the most common. So on January one, John Smith moves into his one bedroom paying $100. And then March one, March one comes around, there's strong demand for units. And the landlord, the sponsor, increases the rents on all the one bedrooms by $100. So March 2nd, the loss to lease on John's unit is now $100 because uh, he's locked in, uh, paying a, paying 1000 sorry, and they increased it 100 but I can't increase his rent anymore. So now if, if you know Samantha comes in on March 2nd, I'm going to lease that same unit for $1,100 while John's locked in at 100 so I lose $100. Uh, and then you extrapolate that over hundreds of units, and then that same scenario repeats month over month. Uh, scenario two, you have what's called a gain to lease. This is rare, uh, and it's also even more, you would never see this on an underwriting deal, uh, and I'll explain why in a second. But uh, on a gain to lease, John, same unit, John moves in, $1,000. March 1, global pandemic hits. Like The chance of that happening is really rare, but imagine <laughs> it does. Uh, now all of a sudden the landlord's having to decrease the rent by a hundred dollars. So now John's actually paying more than, you know, Samantha walks in again on March 2nd with her mask on leases a unit and she's paying $900. So now we're actually happy because John's paying more than the market and kind of works in our favor, but that's a very rare uh, that happens. Uh, and the, so in this example, the reason why you would never see a gain to lease on an underwriting model is because we're just gonna lower the rents. Like if I know that you're not achieving $1,000, why would I underwrite to $1,000 if you're actually achieving 900? So that's why you're never gonna see that underwriting model. Uh, reasons, loss to lease grows. So increased occupancy, uh, hitting renewal quotas, old leases, AKA tenant tenure. So you get, you know, say John's been in the unit for five years. Um, this scenario is gonna repeat over and over and over again, where you, you know, so now March, January one comes around the following year, he's below, say we've increased rent $25 more. So now there's a, to get him to market, as we say, we'd have to raise the rent $125, but we like John, he's paid on time. He's been to all the community events. Like we want him to stay. Uh, so maybe we only renew his rent at $50 more. And then we have another strong year and the rents are hundred dollars on top of what they were the previous year. So now year three comes around, same scenario. We still like John, we want to stay, but to get him to market, we're going to have to raise his rent $150. Uh, we're not, so in that situation, maybe we just increase another $50 because we want him to stay, decrease the loss to lease on his unit. And so now you can see as time goes on over and over again, that, that delta spreads until eventually it gets to the point where it's like, all right, you're $300 below market on the rent. We know you've been a good tenant, but now the financial impact to us is so great that we just have to move you out. Um, and so that's the old tenure. Uh, that's, and so yeah, rent increases, that actually should be number one. That's the number one reason why we have lost the lease because we're always increasing rent. Um, and yeah, that's that. So here's an example. Let's see if you guys are paying attention. Um, you buy a 100 unit property, 100 unit property uh, in December, the average rent is $1,000. So 100 units, $1,000 rent. Um, you start your renovation on January 1, and you increase the rent uh, on all the units by $200. Uh, 
what is the loss to lease for January? So January 31st, when you add it all up, what would that loss to lease be if the loss to lease in December was two thousand dollars, and there were no and there were no move ins and no move outs, so nobody left, nobody came in, no new leases were signed in January, and then extrapolate that over twelve months. So you're starting off with December's loss to lease. Nobody moved in and nobody moved out, so this stays in place. And then now we're at two hundred dollars times hundred units. That's twenty thousand dollars of loss to lease for January one, or for January thirty first. So that's if you add those together, it's twenty two thousand dollars, eighteen percent loss to lease in January. And then when you extrapolate that over the twelve months, just straight line spread it. So and I'll show you visually what that looks like. That's a nine percent on average loss to lease. You typically don't see many pro formas with nine percent loss to leases. Yet you do typically see a lot of pro formas with $200 rent increases. So mathematically, we're showing you that it doesn't work. Loss to lease is a very, I don't know, for some reason in the industry, a lot of people, we just use a generic 3 to 4% number, and they don't try to calculate it. Even though you can calculate it, it's not that hard, as we just demonstrated. And here's what it looks like. This is a trailing 12, just to kind of prove the point here, uh, from a very reputable uh, group. And you can see that this is what loss lease looks like. Their gross potential is holding flat for the most part. They increase it here, they lower it back down, but they, they bump it up. That's, that's how rents go sometimes. You push the rent, you see what kind of feedback you get. If they don't take it, you lower it back down, and you push it again. It's not a, nice, it's not a clean thing. Um, it sales, right? But this is our loss to lease. So you can see it's all over the place, but it's there. There's no month that we don't have any loss to lease. There's always some loss to lease on it. So I should, I need to change the colors. That looks very uh, scary, but it's not scary. Uh, it's, um, but it gets your attention. All right, this is loss to lease, and this is gross potential. At the bottom here, so I'm, what I'm showing you, this is the old gross potential rent. The gross potential rent is all the income that comes in that we're charging for. And then I'm straight lining up. I increased my rent. So now this is you know January 1, we've increased rent $200. And now we're going across, and that's all the way across for a year. This is December 31st over there. And then we increase the new GPR, and so guess what? It spikes up again, and then we're back to here. So then, so this, pretend this is December 31st over there, and it spikes up. So it, it just does this thing. And this is your loss to lease. So you gain a whole bunch of loss to lease, and then eventually as your contracts renew, and as you're renewing all your leases, now you're earning up to that GPR. Or you're earning up to your net rent. And then I just flipped it upside down. So this is, that's what we call, we always say you gotta burn off your loss to lease. It's just the same thing, I just flipped it upside down. So you start off with a lot, and you burn it off so you get to the bottom. Uh, oh, did you guys wanna take a photo of that? And then, um, so this is how I think of it, how we look at it. So now that you've seen it upside down, you've always got this base loss to lease. Remember John, who's been our unit forever, and he's been there for five years, and we like John. Um, so he's got some small loss to lease, so we keep him in there. There's, and we got tons of tenants like John in our properties. So there's always some small churn, and usually it's like a half a percent to a percent. And then we start, we take over, we're going to do a big rehab. We're going to increase the rents a whole bunch. But here's where it gets a little tricky because now our rehab is going to be over 24 months. So we basically draw the point down to year two. But then because we're slick, you know, we're going to increase rent again in year two or you know, in year two, in year one, in the year one, increase rent again. So we're stacking our loss to lease. So it does get a little bit complicated. But this, yes, question, give her the cube. Oh, uh, Joseph, I was wondering, where do you factor in, again, because your John down there is really good, you don't want him to move out, and where do you factor in the uh, make readies? Because keeping him in there, you're actually not losing as much money doing a make ready until a certain point. Yeah, I mean, that, that, the question, great question. Your question is more on the bus business decision of when do we decide to, when it's too much. You know, because that's the other thing. It's like, why would I keep John in there? The delta is 
50 bucks or 100 bucks, but it's going to cost me three, four thousand dollars to make ready. So we're constantly making that decision of, OK, now the delta has gotten too great for us. We're going to go ahead or maybe we've already got the money budgeted from our lender to do his unit. So operationally, it doesn't cost us anything because we're running his make ready through CapEx, through, through capital uh, money. So great question. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is, it gets a little noisy when you're doing a renovation, but then you hit stabilization and then you're back to normal. And then from there on out, it just looks like, like a saw, you know, just zigzag up and down the whole time you raise the rents and it burns off, raise the rents, burns off generally. Um, so conceptually, this is kind of the formula we've came up with. I'm an engineer, as I mentioned. Um, <laughs> so this is. You know, we had to create this. This doesn't exist anywhere. So this was me and my partner, Carrie, sitting in the office, understanding the concept of loss to lease and visually how this works to come up with mathematically, how do you turn that visual into a formula? And that's what that is. Um, so you don't need to know this as a, as a passive. I'm just showing you that this is how it does end up looking where you start off. So this example I'm doing here, I got my, uh, you actually, we actually don't calculate loss to lease, which is the other funny thing. We're actually calculating a rental income and then we take the rental income and we subtract it from the gross potential, which is all your market rents times the number of units. And the Delta is your loss to lease. So I guess the formula for loss to lease is very simple. You just subtract the two. The formula for rental income is more challenging. Uh, and so in this example, I'm starting off with my 137,000. So my in place rental income, and then I'm adding in the 179, which is my gross potential is what I'd like to have, but I got to subtract out the previous gross potential. Uh, so it's my new rent minus my old rent. Uh, and then divide that by 12 because I'm trying to break this up into a 12 because the leases are 12 months twice by 12. And then I'm in month seven. So that means I would have had seven months of this earned. And then you subtract out. Uh, that over there is my base loss to lease number. So the 179,760 times a half a percent base loss to lease. And that, this is my GPR 179 times a half percent. And that's what I end up with is these two numbers, base loss to lease and uh, yeah, and then my rental income. And so subtract it, that's 160. And then to calculate the actual loss to lease was just the subtraction of these two numbers, this one. And that one gives me the loss to lease. So that's simple, right? That's how we do it. <laughs> it yeah. One other question. Yes. All right. You being an engineer, yes, me, my eyes are popping out of my head. And I know my finance people or the bean counters, they love this. But let's say if you're a passive investor and what are the numbers you're really looking at? So if you're a passive investor, that's why we created this rule of thumb right here. Okay. Much simpler. <laughs> Sorry. So if they're increasing the rent by 3%, then you're going to take 3%, you're going to divide it by two, gives you a half, and you're going to add whatever the base loss lease number is. It's going to be a half to one, you decide. So if it's a, um, if it's a kind of a, an area that has more churn or a rougher area, you might go with a higher number. Um, so if we talk about the ranges here, so during a rehab, you might go to smaller number, after stabilizing, you might go to a larger number. Uh, and reason being is that during the rehab, your rent growth is going to be very high to begin with. You're going to be increasing the rent 10%. So 10% by two is five. And so do you want to add a percent on top of that? I mean, if you want to, sure, maybe. Uh, but we, in this game, we're doing a rule of thumb here. So we figure out, all right, you know, a, a five and a half percent loss to lease is pretty good. I feel pretty safe in that situation. Uh, the thing with loss to lease also understand is where this really bites you and why it's important is if you've ever seen those deals, I'm sure you have, where they're showing a big renovation, but we're still going to get 6% cash on cash. I don't know how. We're going to yeah. vacate. We're going to push people out of the property. We're going to have high vacancy, um, but we're going to have you know, low vacancy, low, even lower loss to lease, you know, and still give you your money. Uh, so what happens is, this is one of the areas along with the rehab vacancy. If you don't do both of those right, 
it doesn't really hurt you so much on the exit because on the exit you're already stabilized and it's very easy to calculate stabilized vacancy and stabilized loss to lease. That's where you're, it's basically falls back to the average of three to 4%. But where it burns you is on the interim when you're in that first year, the th first, you know, first three years of the deal. Uh, that's where you get burned on the deal because you are expecting cash flow and no cash flow is coming out of it because the loss to lease and rehab vacancy were miscalculated. And so all the cash flow you thought you're receiving is actually going to pay those numbers. So if you learn nothing today, just know that loss to lease is never ever zero, it has nothing to do with the skill of the operator or the manager company or anything. It's math, same with the rehab vacancy, it's just math. So when you see those things, just remember that they're incorrect. Uh, so here's the last photo with us. If you want the full detailed list, hit this QR code. It'll pop up to our multifamily checklist, um, which is just the 20 items. Uh, as you can see, if you don't have the background of 20 items, it, it really you really need that to understand that. I want to do a part two and a part three. Maybe Quest will be nice enough to have me back, and we'll present you know the rest of the 20 items so you guys can get better prepared. Uh, but at least with this, you'll have the download, so you'll be able to go in and download the full 20 so you can get using them right away. You just may not fully understand them, but that's okay. We'll cover that later. Any questions will be covered. Pretty simple stuff, right? Not really, but if it, if it was simple, we wouldn't be here. But all right. All right, guys. Wait, questions? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.